I want to welcome everybody to the April uh, 2021 meeting of the San Jose Astronomical Association um, Imaging Special Interest Scoop, a Group. Um, tonight we have Mark Strebeck uh, joining us. Mark is a, a former host of the uh, Imaging SIG and uh, handed it down to me a few years ago and uh, we're very happy to have him back again. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about an observatory that he and a couple of friends put together down in um, New Mexico called the Namid Observatory. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark. Cool, thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, we said, I'm with this hobby now for quite a number of years, started out as most of us, telescope in the backyard, at some point something bigger, went to star parties. <clears throat> And again, at some point, that's probably most of us had the idea like, okay, maybe setting up a telescope somewhere else. And then two years ago, or one and a half years ago, um, somebody approached me at Google, that's where I'm working. Um, he's also into this hobby, um, a guy called Manoj. And he's like, well, I have this idea and do you wanna do this? And so we talked a little bit about it. Um, and then as it so happened, uh, there was then the advanced imaging conference in 2019. And so we went there and then literally in the last minute, actually through Tolga, that many of you probably know from, from, from Tolga Astro, um, he introduced us to another guy, Rich from Boston, who apparently talked to him and says like, well, he's thinking about it too. So he got us three together. We spent, I don't know, like half an hour or an hour talking to each other and said, okay, let's, let's actually do this. Then we collaborated, organized, I mean, literally everything online. Um, I think mostly via email. I don't think we actually had any Zoom meeting or anything, but trying to figure out what we want to buy. Um, one of the good ideas that Manoj had right at the beginning was um, one person buys the mount, one person the camera, one person the scope, and then we can use the remaining equipment, again, from filters to cables to, <clears throat> to web power switch and everything. We use the remaining equipment to make it uh, roughly equal, that everybody pays roughly the uh, same amount. And so then the site that we call, uh, that we selected, it's Dark Sky New Mexico. As you can see here on the map, um, it is far south. I mean, when you're there, you see these hills, these mountains over here that are already in, in Mexico. Um, and as you can imagine, it is insanely dark. Like there's nothing around it. Like you can see actually a little bit the, um, the sort of light down from, from Phoenix and somewhere here is Tucson. Uh, yeah, it's Tucson. But that's it. Apart from that, but and it's not a real light dome. It's just on one side of the horizon. You, you can see that there's sort of some type of shine. But for the most part, it's insanely dark. Um, but because it's fairly close to Phoenix, you actually drive, I think, three hours from Phoenix to the site here. So it was also, you can go there. And again, from here, we can fly. I mean, it's, it's like 45 minutes or, or an hour. I, I can't remember how long the flight is. So also having something where we can actually get to fairly easily. Um, and of all the sites that we sort of looked into, it was actually one of the cheapest sites. We pay, I um, can't remember exactly, like something like $400 a month to have our scope there, which is then, again, power, uh, internet, having the scope there, everything around it. And again, they have people on site. So if something small happens, we can just ask them to do it, like to check if a cable is unplugged or something. Um, this is the site itself. Here, this big white building, that's the main farmhouse where um, the, the couple who is running this enterprise lives. Um, this here with the red roof, that's where our scope is in. And all these are basically smaller buildings that they have, all with these roll off roofs that roll off in the evening um, where people have their other telescopes. So this is one of the larger buildings. When we got in there, they have placed space for nine telescopes and we were the eighth. And I think by now they actually rented out the ninth one. And so the next thing that they do is they will build another house somewhere here. Um, what we didn't realize is like the staff there, again, the, the couple who's running it, they're insanely friendly, insanely supportive. Like she actually invited us for dinner pretty much every evening when we were there. 
um, which was awesome. But yeah, when again, when we needed something at the beginning or while the telescope is there or something, they're insanely friendly, really try to make it work. Um, super helpful with absolutely everything. Over here, this is a trailer. Um, this is where L lives. L is the guy who runs all the IT in that, uh, in um, for, for Dark Sky, New Mexico. He's actually the former communications officer of Air Force One. So this guy knows everything about electronics and cables and what have you. And then Michael, the guy who owns this, he's actually a former Corps of Engineer sergeant or something. So he knows everything about mechanics. So both of these two together, lots and lots of knowledge, super helpful. The other thing that we also didn't know is they have a full machine shop there, like all kinds of tools anyway, but really a machine shop where you can do everything. So when we needed something, either we had it or at some point we needed to drill some holes for I think one of the plates or something, not a big deal. They have everything there, super useful. So we didn't even have to bring any tools. They have absolutely everything there. And then the final piece, and this is something that I that was cool, they have really good accommodation. In many of these places, you have nothing. Like when you go there, you either stay in your car or maybe you come with a tent or you have to drive every night, again, 40, 50 miles to the nearest Airbnb or something. Here they actually have a couple of buildings. This here is actually a building where you have these small rooms and here's another building where you can stay. And so that is super awesome that in the evening when you're done, again, it's very dry, um, you're tired and everything, you have a proper place to go in, you, you have an air conditioned place, a proper bed. This was really, really cool. Um, and so then we talked a lot about, so what type of equipment do we want to get? And of course you do this, you put it up there in this dark environment. So of course you try to put together the best possible equipment that you can afford and that you want to have. So a plane wave CDK 14, the 10 micron GM 3000, that's not 300, it's 3000 mount, um, an FLI 5100 microline camera, 65 millimeter filters, because it's a really big chip, Moonlight Nightcrawler folks, so like everything from the best. And then the cool thing was they told us at the site, we can ship everything there and they will keep it for us. So when we come that we don't have to bring a lot of stuff, um, but that they have everything there and, and we can use it there. Well, the downside is we got our hands on all the equipment for the very first time when we actually arrived at the site. So we spent an insane amount of time before we went to trying to make sure we have all the adapters, all the cables, everything, checked it twice, three times, four times, um, making sure that everything fits together, that plates, everything is there. Um, but yeah, basically what you have to do is, this is our pier, how it was when we came, just a pier, nothing around it. You go from this to this in seven days. And as you can imagine, like it's, Again, a lot of work and especially because you put it together for the first time. So you will make mistakes. You will have to do things again. Um, so that was really, really intimidating. Once we realized when we came there and we saw all these crates with the mount, with the scope and everything, we're like, oh my gosh, we, we really have to figure this out. First, first two days went amazingly well. There was pretty much no hiccup. We got the mount up. Getting the mount up, by the way, was huge. This thing is super, super heavy. So just getting it from the ground on this platform, from the platform up here, again, it is super heavy. It doesn't have a handlebar or anything. Um, so that was just a challenge by itself. But we got the mount up, the scope, all the imaging train, the focus of filter wheel camera, filters into the filter wheel, guide scope, cabling. We're pretty much at the end of the second day. We actually, at the end of the second day at night, we actually had a session with the scope to trying to figure out how do we do polar alignment and everything. But then the one thing that we saw and we tried to ignore, this is the roof of the, of the observatory. And if we moved the scope so that it's really pointing high up, there were like two inches between the scope and the roof here. And everybody was really, really uncomfortable about it. Um, 
again, something happens, like can the scope get stuck there? Can, again, something lower a little bit? Uh, so I said, initially we tried to ignore it, but then we agreed, okay, let's take everything down. And then again, Michael knew everyone. There's a guy nearby who was actually designing or building these piers for him. So he was like, look, I can get this pier over there. He will cut it, take some part out, I think take five, six inches out and then weld it back together again. So we took everything down. He brought it over there. And then the next day when we picked it up, like this was like a scene out of Mad Max. It was unbelievable. Like it's in the middle of the desert there and there's a small oasis with some trees. And he has this shop and he actually builds these things that again, look like something from Mad Max. And he actually offered us like, this is actually one, this. To drive around there, but we didn't have the time. And here's then the pier, and here you can see like he cut something out, welded it back together, and then we moved it back. And so now we had to set up everything again. And I, I never know how videos work through Zoom, so hopefully you can see something. This is a time lapse now. Does, does the video come through? Yep, we see the video. That's it. Looks good. Getting the Getting the, the pier first up there, leveling the pier. Uh, Michael helped with that. Now we have the mount. Rich first puts these plates on it. We, can, we need to put the mount on top of it. Uh, some point, I think we take a break in a second. Uh, quick break. That's when Mark has to go uh, comb his hair. <laughs> Lifting this mount up there, as I said, it's it looks easy here, but putting everything back on counterweights. Um, next thing is uh, the the plates uh, for the scope, cables. Yeah, right. We have to put the cables first through the mount before we put on the plates at the top. Um, got the plate up there, um, putting the scope up, uh, some cables, uh, more cables. I think next is the imaging train. Oh yeah, guide scope, guide camera, cabling that up. Uh, now the imaging train, we left it together. So focus our um, filter wheel, everything, cables, uh, now everything is up there. Next, you can see this is something that the 10 micron mount does. It basically has a program that, that tells you if your scope is fully balanced in, in both directions. This is what it was when it sort of moves it forwards, backwards. Yep, that's basically it. And then just getting all the software and everything back installed, um, some of the cables, making sure that everything is there. That was it. So we managed to put everything back together in less than two hours, which was pretty amazing. Um, so at the end of the third night, we basically had the scope set up how we needed it. But then it's still an insane amount of stuff. And again, it's something that you totally underestimate because we usually set our scopes up in our backyards or something. And so we do this over many, many weeks and sometimes months. Again, install the software and everything. And here just software starting from, like, I mean, ASCOM, just the basic package, all the drivers doing the network configuration port forwarding that we can go to it from the outside, installing all the software, time sync, dimension four, the plane wave software, then the imaging software, TSX, polar alignment itself. We spent, I think one night figuring out how to do the polar alignment and then one night actually do the polar alignment. Then doing the web power switch, um, the flat panel, as you can see here. So we mounted the flat panel actually to drive at, towards the end of the week to get this mount here. We, we forgot that we need something like this. So this is a TV mount. And then we put the flat panel up here and then we have basically the parking position of the scope such that it points to the flat panel. So in the parking position, we can take our flat images. And then we installed a small webcam that we can basically see everything. So after eight days, Rich and I left. Um, one thing that happened in the middle actually 
two things we didn't have. There was one cable for the 10 micron mount and an adapter for the guide camera. And Manosh was pretty bummed. He couldn't come, but it was super cool that he could actually go to my place, get the, get the cable from one of my mounts. He still had an adapter for the camera and then he could FedEx it over there that we, I think on the seventh day got everything and we could then put everything together. So it felt pretty good, had everything done. One thing that happened on the last day on the flat panel after we installed it, that's the control box that we had for the flat panel blew up. So we had to take this off. So we couldn't take um, flats with the flat panel, but then we thought, okay, we can take at least sky flats initially. And so the first experience is the FLI or the FL5100, uh, I mean, it's an awesome camera. It's basically two chips, two really large chips together. But it has the unfortunate effect that both chips have very different characteristics, uh, both halves of the chip. It has quite a lot of defects, like this. Um, I don't know if I would call it awesome, though, Mark. It's what? like it has, it has five features and 10 usability issues. You know, it's like one of those cameras where <laughs> it's like it's a square law almost on the usability issue. I don't know. It was an expensive camera. We tried it because the chip was big. and. Yeah. The field of view is narrow and all that, but I think so far you kind of hit an issue every week almost. It's yeah. it's not I don't know. It's like maybe there's an easier camera to use actually. Yeah, and and it turns out it is a camera that really stretches FLI too. Like they don't have a lot of experience with it, and so when we talk to them how to take flat, so anything that like we really don't know. Like we we put this together because it creates an awesome field of view, but you're basically on your own. So yeah, we I think the, the majority of our time, you're right, Manoj, we probably spend on the camera trying to figure something out with it. Um, and then we realized we can't really take sky flats because of the two different halves who have completely different characteristics. We couldn't figure out, I mean, in theory, you should be able with proper darks and bias frames, you should you would think that you are able to get the two different halves here out of the darks and bias frames, we could never figure this out. We could never figure it out to do the calibration that it basically equalizes both halves. The other thing that we then found is that our dark and bias frames weren't really dark. That, I mean, the camera has a shutter, but it doesn't shut completely. So we realized at some point that we actually have some artifacts usually in the middle of the image that it's not fully dark. And so we took, we started to take uh, images anyway. One thing that we realized, guiding didn't work. And we suspected that something is loose on the, on the guide scope, on the guide camera. Unguiding, we still don't know why. We can't get up to 30 minutes one by one, uh, winning one by one images. Like 50% of the images have like in elongated stars. It's, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't stay on it. And then the uh, plane wave software, one of the main, or the main thing that we use it for, it actually has mirror heaters to make sure that no, no dew forms. Um, theory, it shouldn't happen too often, but it can get actually pretty cold there at night sometimes. Um, and so it's a software that's, that's pretty cool that basically keeps the mirrors just slightly above ambient temperature. So, so it has a, uh, th uh, it has a sensor outside and then it sensors on the mirrors itself. Um, but one thing that we had is it actually crashed pretty much every night after we used it for a little bit. And what it turned out to be, Tolga also told us this, that um, it actually needed too much power. And so when the heating kicked in and then we did something else with the mount or with the scope, the mount or focusing or something, it actually exceeded it and then the, the software crashed. So I had to go back. So then I went back two or three months later um, with my wife. She actually loved it. It's pretty beautiful down there. So we spent a couple of days, replaced the flat panel, the control box had the same issue again. It blew up again. And so what it, what it did is when we moved the flat panel to, I think it has 250 steps. When we moved it above 100, the, the fuse basically blew off the control box. And I went through, I don't know, five or six different fuses. And then I had two left until I realized what happened. And then 
we at least took calibration files manually so that I knew, okay, I can't regulate it too high. Um, and then we covered the scope completely, took some, uh, some bias and dark frames, replaced the guide camera. The guide camera that we initially had had a pretty small field of view. So it sometimes had problems to actually find the guide scar. Tightened the guide scope, hopefully hope that we can get the issues like flexure out of it. Installed a second power supply and then redid the whole polar alignment. And pretty much as it was the first time, all these things usually take a little bit longer than one night it was not clear. So finished everything literally in the last minute, but didn't have the time to really do one full imaging run to say like, okay, let's take again, proper images. Let's see if absolutely everything worked. I thought it worked. Um, so we had now one set of calibration frames. Um, guiding still didn't work and we couldn't figure it out until today why it doesn't work. It's basically some, it, it has to be some differential flexure, but I tried everything. I mean, when I was there the second time, I checked every screw that is between the scope and the guide scope and the camera. I tightened everything like crazy. When I do something, I can't see any play, but somewhere there is some play. Um, I then wrote, I picked inside script to basically equalize these two halves. So it basically takes from every script that uh, you basically mark a dark region in your, in your images and say like, okay, measure the level at these dark regions where there's no stars, figure out what the difference is and basically multiply everything on one side of the, of the image with this factor to get both halves at the same level. And then I had to go through it and manually mark all the bad columns that are in the sensor. Cool thing is, this is the first, and I have to say, so far only image that we got out of the scope of M51 that we took. I mean, once everything is together, it is amazing what the scope does. Like the, again, it's the location, it's dark, the scope itself, it's, I mean, I took images of M51 before. This was just yeah. absolutely unbelievable to see the amount of detail that we get, the dust lanes, the galaxies in the background and everything. Yeah, so I, actually, I just want to say, that, I mean, the same image, I mean, this is a fairly big and bright target, right? But look, look at the sort of dust loops that we can get from that sky. It's uh, almost insane. Like, I mean, I don't know if Mark, you can highlight the dust loop on the lower, lower yes, part of the... Yeah, yeah I mean, I've never seen that before. Even if you go on Astrobin, you don't see that, right? Yeah. And this wasn't even like... I don't think we had a lot of hours on this either, right, Mark? Like six hours, something like that? It's nothing extraordinary, yeah. Wow, yeah, it's insane. I mean, so the, the spot is really good. Yeah. Uh, I think the challenge is the equipment, right? And getting that dialed in, especially during COVID times where we cannot travel all that much. Um, but yeah, Mark and Rich did all the heavy lifting. Literally, pun intended. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's a cool thing. Like the images that you can take at these locations, I mean, it blows everything away that I know of, even from star parties. Again, even at star parties, you have some stray light there. Actually, the, the second time we were there, as I said, this one night, it was actually overcast. And from the observatory to the place where we stayed, this house, it's like two or 300 feet. And I wanted to walk from the observatory to our house and it's pitched dark. You couldn't see anything. Like I've never been in a place where it's just absolutely dark, where you don't even see like some contours or something. It's just dark. So yeah, it's, it is cool. And the air, because down there in South New Mexico, it's, it's pretty high up. So the air is really, really calm. So that's the other thing that it's, you, there's not much turbulence or anything. So it's, it's actually from the location, it's a pretty fantastic site. And yeah, so what we have now is, so as I said, we still have the differential flexure. So we decided after trying it twice, it's probably something that we can't figure out. So we will replace it with an off-axis guider. Um, we used, or, or, or we use ACP, which for this type of observatory on one side, it's awesome because you basically enter some targets and ACP figures out which target is high enough in the sky, how much images can I take? It moves to the other ones. It does all the scheduling itself um, together with the, um, with the observatory. They basically 
put like a small file there that we can then use to see if, if the roof is open or not. So it starts up itself. It calls the whole startup routine. So it does everything. So it's amazing when it works, but it also seems to be one of these software ACPs that's kind of finicky. Like it, it crashes from time to time. Um, the other thing is the scheduling. Again, on one side, it's awesome that it does it, but we now have, I can't remember, like 15 targets and only one or two targets are fully imaged. All the other ones are like 70% done, 80% done, 90%. No, but Mark, that's uh, probably my fault though. No. I mean, it's it actually, it's, it's um, once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty, I mean, it's just an algorithm, right? At the end of the day, it's nothing magical, but it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's just that, you know, if you look at our targets, right, a lot of them, um, you know, we either intentionally or unintentionally have horizon constraints or moon constraints that don't that don't fire, right? And as a result, it doesn't image them. Yeah. Uh, we even have like rising plan delays and things like that. It's basically uh, two things I want to say about ACP, right? I mean, the software UX like the user experience and the interface is pretty crap, right? It, like, we just we should just put it out there. It's like you know, 1960s car. You kind of have their UI back, right? It's it's like pretty terrible. But at its core, though, it's fairly stable. It crashes whenever an under. It depends on a lot of things, right? It depends on a lot of ask on drivers, devices being connected, being on the same com port. Like this, there's a whole bunch of things. Any of that changes, it, it will crash, right? That's pretty much all it can do is not, I mean, there's nothing much it can do. Um, and as a result, we're seeing some of those crashes, but I think we can clean that up, right? Once the scheduling works though, I mean, I have targets which are running for more than a year at this point. So, you know, these, these may be winter targets or whatever, and I have like, I don't know, hundred hours. 50 happens in 2020, 50 happens in 2021, right? But it's kind of nice that you can actually do that over multiple years and still collect like massive quantities of data, right? Uh, with, with optimal conditions. I just, I just want to say that because it's not, I don't think the software is buggy, right? It, it's not, it, it's just very convoluted to use, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, and it depends on weather files, I mean, just last week, I think, you know, Mark and I and Rich, we, we realized they changed the location of the weather file. So it couldn't access the weather file anymore. And it's default assumption, which by the way, it's the right thing to do. If I can't hit a weather file that's recent, I'm gonna assume everything is unsafe. So it assumed everything was unsafe and it didn't image anything for like six days, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, that's not necessarily the software's fault, right? It's just, we don't know where the weather file is and if, if it's safe to image. So it has some it's like you know, nuances that you need to know, but other, I mean, it works for the most part. But if you get it dialed in, it's actually pretty nice to be able to enter targets for the next five years, right? Like, I mean, I have, on my home observatory, I have like, I don't know, 60 targets at this point. And it just images whatever is right at the right time. And some targets finish. I mean, of course you need to have like, I don't know, a 10 TB drive. But whenever something finishes is when I process it, right? But it is challenging to get it up and running to a you know, reasonable speed in the beginning though. Yes, you can hear. Manosh and I have slightly different opinions about ACP. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a question. So when you get crashes and crap like that, um, are you able to deal with it remotely okay? You know, you can, you know, worst case power cycle the computer and it comes back up and you're at least able to debug and, and stuff. You ever have any issues where the remote aspect of the computer is a problem? Yeah, so far we only had one instance where we had to ask the guys on site to restart the computer. Because what we have is we have the web power switch so we can remotely um, turn everything on and off. Um, and then again, the moment the computer gets turned on, it, it reboots and everything. So it should work. Well, it didn't work the other day and we couldn't figure out really why it was. Um, it was actually a problem that, I think it was two problems. Somehow our computer was stuck and we couldn't get any longer to the web power switch. 
And so we had to ask them to just restart everything and then we started it and then we could get back to it. So yes. Yeah, but for the most part, if it crashes, you know, restart usually just fixes it. You know, you, I mean, what I've noticed is ACP crash, like, you know, let's say underneath it, right, it's using a 10 micron driver, right? In, in our case, it's using a 10 micron driver, it's using the FLI ASCOM driver, right? If one of those crashes, there is no graceful degradation. Right. It'll just crash. The whole the whole thing will just crash. And unfortunately, the only way to recover is to restart everything. Um, but yeah, for the most part, restarting everything seems to work. I mean, in preparation, Mark knows this, right? In preparation for this, I ran pretty much the same setup here in my backyard. And the goal was to never go into the observatory, right? So you just everything is robotic. So it was pretty much the same setup. And it would crash all the time. At 10 micro, I was using some version of the driver, which had some issue where if you connected both the Ethernet port and the RS232C, it would crash. Like, it's just this weird bug that the 10 micron driver has, where if both of these interfaces are active and you did a specific command sequence, it would crash, right? But what you see, on a, on a real life use case is that ACP crashed and your sequence halted, right? And you start unwrapping that third button and you realize, oh yeah, this is what it is. You fix the driver, then ACP is behaving fine. The other situation is, you know, sometimes um, if it's not able to control certain devices, but you know, it's executing scripts, but it's not, the script fails, it'll fail, right? So there are those things that you have to, the underlying things that you have to uh, fix. But if you assume that everything that depends on is perfect, it'll keep working, right? I mean, it's mostly just an automation, uh, time-based automation stuff. Um, but it, it does take getting getting used to, right? And, and to Mark's point, you know, the question really is, is it simpler for us to go every night and just bootstrap everything? and pick a target and run it and shut it down in the morning? This, this, this is the question, right? I mean, you could use something like, I don't know, SGP Pro, or uh, there was another one, Mark, I think that you had brought to attention, right? Which is newer, which have much better user experience. Yeah, they have much better user interfaces, uh, stuff like that. The, the one reason I keep coming back to ACP and, and using it is because of the, the kind of fill it and forget it kind of a user experience, right? In the sense that you can just enter targets. You don't even have to care when it's gonna be up, right? It could be up in December, you're sitting in April, you go hit the target and you enter it and it'll image it in December, right? So that's sort of, what happens for me is, you know, I go look at an APOD picture or some, you know, I don't know, like Astro image of the day or whatever, the target looks interesting. I just go enter it in the ACP and it'll, it'll image it whenever it's right to image it, right? So that sort of automation is the only reason I keep coming back to it. But to Mark's point, it is a warthog, and you kind of have to love a warthog to be able to get get around those issues. But once you do, and it keeps working, like I mean, right now in my the one in San Jose, I haven't had to go in in about I don't know eight months, nine months. I'm not, I haven't gone into the observatory, right? But it's it's running every night. It comes up at sunset. 15 minutes after sunset, whatever, images the right targets and then shuts down. If there isn't enough work, it does the right thing, stuff like this. But to get there, it took me a year and a half, right? But you, you keep talking about ACP, but it actually forces you to use Maxim DL to do the actual- it does, And that's a big downside, I think. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, Maxim is another water tower, right? I mean, it's just this, this thing that, tried to do way more than it was supposed to do. And it's kind of like all these artifacts which are insanely painful. Um, and you're right. I mean, that is a downside. Like there are these downsides, right? That you have to use the Maxim. But I mean, with my Maxim right now, I'm just using ASCOM driver. It's pretty much just a image acquisition tool, right? It doesn't, I don't do any guiding or anything like that with Maxim. Uh, so it's primarily just a, a mechanism to acquire pixels, right? But yes, you're right. It does have that shortcoming, right? Yeah, it seems like the, the 
there needs to be a new ecosystem for this kind of thing because those two tools are really aging and insist on using each other. Yeah, the one thing that yeah, yeah, the one thing that that we looked into it's it's unfortunately not there is um, this is other program called Voyager, which I started to use for uh, my my telescopes here in the backyard. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a scheduler yet. They're basically working on that too. Basically, it's a similar idea to ACP, where you have one program that basically does take uh, does, that takes care of all the imaging, and then a second pro uh, and then a second program that says, okay, I tell you which image to take, where to go, how many frames to take, and everything. Um, that, at least from my experience so far, is also a questionable UI, but it's much, much more stable and it's really, really well thought through. But but yeah, the, the full automation, but again, full automation, I would say once a week, you have to pay attention to something that ACP does or doesn't do. We, again, we have to look in sometimes, again, as we found out now, it's like, hey, the file wasn't updated, the weather file, so it didn't take any images. ACP doesn't send you an, a, a, a message saying like, hey, the, the file seems to be outdated. For all we know, it looks like, well, it maybe was cloudy every night, so it didn't take any images. Um, so as I said, like it does most of it automatically, but you still have to pay quite a lot of attention actually to make sure that it works. And maybe over time it will get better, but at least so far, it's, yeah. yeah we need to have a Manoj on the team, right? I mean, I, I mean to, be, to be frank, I, I... I'm with you guys on, on all of the downsides it has. And, and to Mark's point, I actually tried to replicate everything that the ACP does in uh, SGP Pro. Okay. I mean, I, basically what I did was I took all the targets that I had, to, I had entered into scheduler and I recreated those targets in SGP in a, in a single, um, what do you call it, project or whatever, right? With different start times and start dates and all that. Like I, I tried to do it. It was just way more work, right? It was easier to fix the underlying issues and make them stable and just have ACP do its thing. Like the weather file, those are controllables, right? Like those are things you can control and it's a one-time fix, right? If you just make sure that the weather file is always in the same place, you don't actually have to go back and tweak ACP. It, it just work. So, when I had full control of the system, like in my observatory, I, I just fixed the underlying things and just used ACP. But if you do have these sort of variables that are outside of ACP, then it's probably very painful to use, right? I mean, which so far has been painful to use in New Mexico compared to in San Jose, which is very different experiences. And that's mostly because of the underlying systems. And that's, and that's exactly it. Like it did something, it's amazing. I, well, I was quite surprised when we set this up, how many things I can't easily fix. Because again, we have our scopes in our backyard and I, again, I, I thought I have my scopes fully automated, but apparently I go quite often out there and do something, filter a cable that's stuck or something. So just figuring all this out that it's super reliable, runs every night, doesn't crash and everything. It's actually quite a lot of work. Um, yeah, the other thing that we have is, as I said, like I had to sort of mark all these bad columns in our chip manually. And what I then realized when we took more images, these bad columns, they are not stable. And it's not that we get more and more over time. It's actually some bad columns are suddenly good columns again. And we reached out to FLI. They couldn't explain it. They couldn't figure it out. So it means for every image, we basically have to go through it. Like you go through all your frames and check where do you have a bad column that you can uh, calibrate it out. And you so know, this I, let us that we said, maybe we need to get a different camera. This camera is just way too finicky. I'm really surprised that FLI isn't standing behind the product. I mean, their, their reputation is that they make the best cameras out there. And I understand we're a small part of their revenue, but how can they claim to be the best and sell cameras that are like 10 grand when you have problems right out of the box and they can and they just kind of say gee sorry uh not our problem yeah. you know, so I it's actually group. FLI, group. no no hang on fli was actually bought two years ago yeah and the guy who ran it actually stepped down he's not with the company 
And the new company just looks purely at the revenue. If they actually go to the FLI website, they discontinued 80% of their cameras and 80% of their filter wheels. They just, I mean, shrank it down. Much much right? It's microscopy that they're focused on now. Yeah. But uh, Bruce, to your point, right, when we met back in SIG, right, which is when uh, Mark and I actually came up, we kind of figured out we would do an observatory in New Mexico. When I went to their booth, and I showed them one of the images I captured uh, with the 5100. The first thing he said, Gary, was, oh, wow, look at that, no seam. Now, back then, I didn't realize the significance of what he was saying, but now I do, right? Because they probably heard it from every one of their customers. And I hadn't done much to, to fix it, right? Uh, in fact, I, I ended up doing a VC with one of the engineers, and they tried to look at it, and they were showing me some of their calibration uh, tests that they're doing, and you could still see the seam, right? I mean, the point is, the point I'm trying to make is, is it a problem big enough for them to fix, right? And I, and I contend that from a revenue perspective, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, and since they were bought, I think it's very clear that the focus is now on, again, medical equipment and wherever they need these cameras, but it's not, again, I think since uh, Jim left, Again, he's into uh, in, into astrophotography himself, and I think since he left, it's basically just a sideshow for them. But yeah, it's kind of sad. Um, the other thing that we now saw in some of the images recently is is this effect here that we have in the upper third, like different levels, and this weird thing in the middle, and we can't figure that out. And this is not in every image, so. There's no way that we can calibrate this out. Um, and yeah, so as I said, I think with the camera sooner or later, we'll probably say like, look, let's, let's get a different camera. Let's get something that's more established, more tested, more, more stable. Uh, I, you know, if it was like this out of the box though, I would hope that they could take it back or if you got it from Tolga that he would stand behind it um, because you know, that's a big investment. Um, it is, yeah. I bought it directly from them. Uh, maybe I should contact them and see if they'll take it back. I don't think they will, to be honest. I mean. Yeah, at this point, probably not. Yeah. But yeah. But it's OK. It's, it's like, basically, that the, the one that Mark is showing right now, it's completely perplexing. I, I'm not sure. Uh, what that is, we have to figure that out. Um, but the seam has always been there from day one, right? And, and their claim was always that your calibration frames would take care of it. And it would, depending on the signal level and all that. But once you start moving into a dark sky spot, you're, you're imaging things that have very low signal. And so that channel gain difference that you have starts showing up more prominently, right? And to Mark's point, the, the, the challenge with that seam, and, and he knows how I used to deal with it before, I would just deal with it by hand, right? There was no script, nothing. After stacking, I would just correct it. But when you stack, right, the seam is moving because of dithering or whatever, it's moving between the frames. It's kind of like you have this band, actually. It's not it's not even a seam anymore. It's a, it's a band that you have to correct. Um, it's still possible, though, and it's not too bad. But you get this massive field of view, right? And it's low noise and all of that. Yeah. But these kind of issues, like, you know, which are not predictable, is the one that's really hard, right? Where, you know, you start having new dark columns or, or light columns and like hot pixels, whatever, or, or like this kind of stuff where you just start having random bands. That's the hard part is like, there's no way to deal with that, right? Because it changes image over image and, and like we can't. Every set, like it's just so much work to process. Like you know, Mark or Rich, if they have to process their images, yeah. it's just an insane amount of work. Like right? we got to go and do this all by hand. Yeah. The regarding the the bad columns, uh, I've noticed that uh, one of the Pix Insight scripts that I've been using lately seems to figure that out and remove them without me having to go in and say, you know, column 511, 715 or whatever. You just check box, uh, create, uh, fix 
bad columns and it just does it. Let me follow up. I would love to. I, yeah. I, I tried this. I could never figure this out. I spent. Yeah, I, I would not have to know what this script is as well. Who, is who this is... uh, auto integrate.js? Yeah. I, okay. I tried that. Yeah, the other thing, for example, was again coming back to FLIs. Again, we can see that the two different chips have slightly different gains, not just different levels, but also different gains. And they insist it's not possible. It's the same chip, just two different physical instances of the chip, but they should have exactly the same gain. And we're like, look, we can see it, we can measure it. But yeah, it just means FLI literally doesn't know how to calibrate things, which as I said, it's bad, but they don't sell the camera any longer either. So as I said, for them, I think this is not something that they will spend a lot of time trying to help us with. Yeah, Bruce, if you're interested, I'm, I'm selling the camera. Yeah. The other thing that we then had was, let me actually go back here. Um, yeah. That we then realized we have to move our flat panel much, much closer to the scope. Because right now, if we do it like this, we actually don't get the uh, chip evenly illuminated. We, we get vignetting on top of the scope vignetting on the sides. And as you can see, it's A, quite a lot of distance that we have to cover here. So we have to figure out how to put this whole mount and move it yeah, sort of a solid foot or something closer to the skull. The second challenge that we have is this wall here, it's not 100% stable. Like it's quite often pretty windy there and this wall moves a little bit back and forth. So if we now move our flat panel really close to the scope, at some point this wall moves and then it will actually hit the scope. You can try a heavy duty light stand maybe that you could mount it to. We, we actually talked to them. Michael, the guy who's running it, doesn't like the idea that something is standing on the floor because they sometimes have to go into the building to clean it or to repair something. And he doesn't want to have anything that he accidentally might knock over or might kick or something. So he- what about from the pier? That's yeah. something that we discussed. This is something where then L chimed in and he's like, look, if, we, if you do it on the pier, you put sort of an uneven load on the pier. And he, he was very uncomfortable with the idea. And normally I would say like, well, it's a pretty stable pier. L was the guy who told us from day one, look, your scope is too close to the roof. I think you will have to take it down. I ignored L's advice once and it was pretty bad. So I'm like, you know something about this. If you tell me this could cause issues, then it might cause issues, so I might not push it. I guess a flip flat would be another possible approach, right? It's mounted on the OTA. Right. Not for a costume, Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, Flip flaps are not made in that size. So right. we have to do this. So and, and a trust tube, right? It's not made for a trust. I mean, it actually, uh, because this is a trust tube scope, you know, you, the way you do the flip flap is you have to tight, tighten that, that zip tie, whatever. It's actually going to put undue stress on the trusses. So we, we investigated flip flaps, to be honest, right? Yeah. So, uh, so Michael told us that this wall, they will make it much more stable because I think they were even getting a little bit afraid of it, how much it moves. So hopefully they make this wall more stable and then we can somehow figure out, again, how to basically put a wooden block here or something to move this flat, this panel really, really close to the scope. Um, but yeah, that's one thing that we have to figure out. We have a new control box for the five panels that actually shouldn't have this issue any longer. So main thing is we have to do another trip down there. Regarding your, your need to go to an off-axis guider, uh, yeah. I know that you, you voiced uh, displeasure with off-axis guiders in the past. Um, I have had bad luck with off-axis guiding also. Um, and uh, I don't know if it would work with your CDK, your, uh, you know, your, your scope, but uh, the uh, on-ag has worked wonders for me you, you know, as far as being able to use the whole frame for guiding and uh, just works really well. And you can also use it for focusing if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so that might be something worth investigating if you can fit it in your imaging train. Yeah, the problem is again? I missed it. Can you say that again, please? The on-ag, uh, yeah, on-axis guiding. Size though. I mean, with the 5100, I have an on-ag. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't cover the full chip. 
but if you switch to a different camera, yeah, that is. By the way, I I, I have to say I don't know. I tried to use on I've had it for about four years now. I've never managed to use it successfully. This software is just too um, too painful. I don't know. Like it, maybe it's just me. Uh, I'll just say to my own in my own defense that I have used ACP and that's pretty painful as well. I just felt not like I couldn't get on act to work. Right? It's just super painful to get it to work. Um, Glenn and I use it. Uh, yeah, know, it does definitely work. But uh, they have a newer version of the software also uh, that came out. Yeah, it could be. I mean, this this chip wouldn't work with on act. I, I already okay. investigated. Um, but if you went to a different chip. That's that is an option um, that we can consider, and I guess it also gives you focus assistance, right? Because it has that that um, focus lock. Yeah, the focus lock. Yeah, and and not that I've been a hundred percent successful, but I'm not much of a machinist or whatever. But you know, I've been goofing around with making my own on egg, so you know you can. You can buy a cold mirror in whatever size you need if you've got a three inch image circle or whatever and you know do the machining and everything but that's a pretty major project but it is doable um, I you know the, the theory that we went in with, with right um, is that we don't need guiding uh, to be like I, I'll just I'm like, ready. Lay that was not my theory, just to put it out there. These guys no, are no, 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 no. like, look, let's have a guider. We don't know how it works. Like, oh, no, this is this is stable enough. Yeah, I mean, Rich and I were like, look, this mount can do unguided. Okay, let's just go unguided, right? And then Mark was like, no, 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 we should at least have a backup. Like, yeah, we can't go there on a day's notice, right? Um, mm -hmm. What, what I, I mean, I don't know, like, you know, I'm, I'm running the exact same mount here and it's running unguided for about two years now, right? And I've right. only pulled up aligned it once. So there is something to be said. I mean, the mount I think can do it. It's just that you have to get so many other things right before it can actually be fully unguided, right? I, like sub-pixel precisions and all that. Just, I mean, this field of view, uh, I think the pixel resolution is uh, half an arc second, right, Mark? I think it's about half an arc second. And, and so, yeah, it does put a lot of demand on the model that it created in 10 micron, but it's, you know, it's getting there, right? It has the precision to be able to do it. It's just, we, we are not there yet, right? So we do have a guider, but maybe, I mean, now we got a Sagita, right? I, I think we're going to try that next for the guider and we'll see. The other thing also is, you know, if we remove that, the one we're using is a Takahashi uh, really long focal length guider because and we wanted to match it to the field of view, right? Uh, and that obviously is like, you know, it has really long moment arms, right? When we go with Sagita, we're gonna be removing that. And that probably may make it a little bit more stable as well in terms of the kind of moments it's putting on the mount, right? Because we saw these things, I don't know, Mark, if you, you didn't have it in your slides, but did we see these things where in one direction it would have worse yeah. Uh, start rails in another direction. So there, there were some indications that maybe something was dragging it in one direction of, of tracking, right? It wasn't strictly related to just just uh, imbalance or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of experiments to do still, I think. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, it's the same thing again. It's like, so we do all our homework trying to figure it out which is that we need, which off-axis guider, which camera and everything. In the end, it will be the same thing again. It's like you go, you have, I don't know, a few days, integrate it, and hopefully it works because then you leave again. That's mm -hmm. that's really the thing that I I definitely underestimated. Like again, if you really can't just go and do something small, oh try this out or integrate this or something, it's like. You take something and it basically has to work pretty much out of the box. You don't have a lot of time to integrate it, troubleshoot it or something. Um, so Mark, you're a it definitely doesn't help that you can't easily fly there. I think otherwise we might have flown out there a little bit more often. Mark, you're a Googler. Um, so what's your postmortem here? I mean, a lot of people have remote observatories. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think yours is on the lower end of experiences. So, you know, what would you, you know, like, I mean, 
So obviously you'd get a different camera, but is there a higher level? You know, maybe you shot too high. What do you think? What, what what's your, you know, so I, so I think one thing that we should have done is, and this is actually something coming back to this guy L. That's what he told us what we should do is, I think what you should do is don't ship all your stuff to the remote site and then assemble it there. Ship it to someone, assemble it where you can really take your time, figure everything out, all the screws, all the cables, everything. Make it basically work in your backyard and then disassemble it and send it. I think that would have been probably, that would have made our trip easier. And we probably would have seen a couple of these issues that we then saw that you then on site can't easily troubleshoot and can't easily fix. That I think is one of the things. It's, it's fairly expensive to ship it first here and there, but I think yeah. that's worth doing it. And that's actually, as I said, that's what they recommended um, that they said, like, look, do it first and then package it up and send it here. And we knew that. Yeah, we kind of tried to do that actually in the sense that, I mean, we replicated the mount in the camera, but not the scope, right? This is a big part of it. I ran the same camera on the, on the same mount here, uh, but I ran it on a refractor, right? With a much broader field of view. No, no, but so the whole thing, I mean, the focus that was new to us, the, yeah. the guide scope and everything. So, I mean, the guide scope, the differential flexure, we probably could have figured this out if we had it set up somewhere else. I mean, it's it's fairly obvious once you have the item. I, I yeah, replicating the setup somewhere else or doing the setup somewhere else first, reading out all the bugs so you know exactly sort of uh, what are the issues you're going to have would be way easier once you, once you go remote, right? Because everything becomes a little bit harder once you're remote, even, even if you're SRO, right? That's still like three hours drive plus, I don't know, sleeping in your car, right? It's not easy. Uh, and I think, you know, you've got to be very quick to sort of get to the root of the problem and fix it, which is harder for us right now because we don't have a, a replica of this with one of us, right? I think the other thing, again, this is where we were lucky, um, again, that they have the full machine shop there and everything. We didn't expect it. We didn't realize we wouldn't need it. Again, I think if you put your scope somewhere, really understand the site really well. What is there? What can they help you with? We were super lucky that we had, again, two people on site that could help us. The guy who could like cut down the pier and weld it again. Like We were lucky that this all worked because they have literally everything there. But not every site is sort of similarly equipped. And I think that's the other thing that I would make next time I would do it in a different site, I would make sure that I understand really, really well everything that the site has and offers and everything that I have to bring or I have to take care um, beforehand. Yeah, I think those are the two main things. Um, Having a, a hosting site that has an expert in, in uh, you know, the uh, networking is fantastic, but you it would be even more helpful to have somebody who can really engineer your mount and scopes and get rid of, yeah. you know, help you solve the problems that you're having. So, I mean, actually they, they offered us to do it, but in the end, it's like, do I now want somebody else to figure all the stuff out? I mean, for him, it's also new. We're like, look, uh, it's again, I think that's the thing. All this equipment is so proprietary that it would probably take him almost as much time as us to figure this out. I actually think I have to say, like having the two guys, Michael, who knows everything that there is about mechanical engineering, and having Al that knows everything that is about electrical and network engineering. I think that was probably the most helpful thing that, that we could use. Mm -hmm. These are things that I'm just not good at. I'm good at, with computers. I'm fairly good with 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 the equipment, but these are things that I would struggle with, and that that was fantastic. Um, well, at the same time, I mean, this might sound like boy, that's like it's cool, like going there, setting it up, being at the side. I mean, again, most of us we are in it not just to take cool images. Most of us are in it to, to tinker around with the equipment. Sure. You, Definitely do that. Like I enjoy every minute that I spend on this thing, even if I sometimes think, man, it would be nice if it would just work. Still pretty cool. Like you log in, you're thing remotely, you can see through your webcam, 
it points, it does things. You have the super dark sky. It's pretty cool. And Mark, it's also fair to say that if it was, this wasn't 2020, I mean, unfortunately, our timing wasn't all that great. Uh, we didn't we didn't talk to COVID before we and we didn't kind of coordinate. Uh, if this hadn't happened in 2020, I, I don't think this presentation would have looked much different, right? I should caveat that. I think a lot of our challenges is because of COVID, we haven't been able to make as many trips as we would have liked to and, and fix a lot of these issues, right? Mark and Rich were gracious enough to go a couple of times even during COVID and all that, but that made it a lot harder, right? Because even the site, you know, wasn't allowing a lot of remote visitors. And so it made it a little bit more challenging. But if you were to do it in normal times, even with all of these issues, you would make progress much quicker, right? Literally, I think, right, Mark, you guys went in, was it April or May of 2020, right? Right after all the lockdowns. Yeah. That was the first setup, right? So you can imagine, you know, some of our issues have been that as well. Although I have but to say, did. that was one of the cool things when we had crazy lockdowns in California and you go literally in the middle of nowhere. You feel pretty safe there. You can't get infected. Like, it's... <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, 2020, I mean, I think that was one of the challenges as well. We, we actually selected the site so that we could make fast trips. And yes, as Manoj said, we, we just can't. Otherwise, again, it is a site. We could go over a weekend. We could fly out Saturday morning, be there yeah. Saturday afternoon, spend the whole night, do something, and then fly back on, on Sunday. And it's not a big deal. Like That was exactly one of the reasons why we, why we picked the site that's, again, accessible. And mm -hmm. that's definitely not the thing that we could do. Hey, I, I have another ACP related question if this is the appropriate time. Um, are you guys, are you using a, another planning tool to, to, to populate ACP like Sky Tools Imaging or, or are you just, you just use ACP? Just straight up ACP. You just, you, I mean, basically what we're doing is whenever we find an interesting target, um, which is going and entering the uh, coordinates and, and uh, the times for it to image, the, the scheduler basically mm -hmm. from the web forms, right? So each one of us has a login and we just go in, log in, and, and enter the targets. Um, and I, I don't think we've had any issues with that per se. Oh, no. Downs like just setting up the user accounts. Like there, there yeah. were so many things at the beginning. Oh. I don't like AC. It took me about a week, I think, right, Mark? I, mean, I, I kind of went in after after Mark and Rich set up everything, then the nook that we had in there and created the remote uh, logins, etc. I went in, it took me about a week plus to get ACP up and running, right, with all the software installed and the drivers and stuff like that. Also, I mean, I wouldn't say all of that, you know, it's just, housekeeping, right? Most of it is bookkeeping and install the right software, get it up and running. I don't think it's too painful. For the planning itself, because it's a scheduler that we're using, you don't need a separate planner, right? Because the scheduler is the planner. Uh, the, the premise is that you should just be able to say what you want to image and it'll image it at the right time. Uh, and that's sort of what we've been doing, except there's these other things we have to resolve, right? And, and one of the challenges is because we are using guiding and, and someone rightfully pointed out earlier, ACP uses Maxim, um, right? Now the guiding is in Maxim and things like this. I mean, in theory, none of that is a real problem, but anytime you're using software that you don't normally use, like I don't normally use Maxim, right? I mean, I use something else. It's a learning curve that you have to go through. And that learning curve, some find it fun, some maybe not so much, right? But that's what it is. But I think for us, the goal was have a remote setup. Each one of us, one of us goes, finds interesting targets during our regular lives. And then we just want to be able to enter it into a database and it gets imaged. Uh, and our group rules are that everybody gets the data, right? It's not, you know, it's not Mark entered a target, only Mark get the data. So. It, it, the idea is it's sort of like a community project almost, right? So we each of us go enter interesting targets and then everybody has interesting data to process at the end of it, for which scheduler works pretty well, actually, right? Because you can just go enter targets uh, whenever you feel like it and it'll image it whenever it's ready, right? Whenever it's right. 
Um, so the theory is promising. We just had to get into a spot where it's it's coming along nicely. And I would say, you know, we have some issues, right? Like guiding is one, the chip is another. If we resolve those two big ones, I think we're on a good trajectory. I actually have to say that this is something that, that worked really well, thanks to Manash, who sort of said at the beginning, like, look, here's the rules how we do it. Again, we share the images. We all agreed if somebody wants to leave, the group has sort of first rights to buy. So you can't just say, look, I want to leave and I take my scope. It's like, if the group says, no, we would like to keep it, the group can keep it. And this might sound a little bit, I don't know, administrative, but I think it's actually pretty cool because again, it's in the end, quite a lot of money that you have there. And I think it was great that Manosh said like, look, let's just set up these rules that we all know what we're getting into. Um, I think the other thing that I would say, which was, I think helpful, all three of us, Manosh, Rich and I, I, we, it's not that anyone is really rich, but we never had troubles to say like, oh, somebody spent $50 more or $50 less, or I go one more time, I have to pay. Like, I think that is the other thing that made it fairly relaxing that nobody really looked into how much time and in particular, how much money everybody spends. It's like, we, we try to make it even like when we now bought the off access guider, we said, okay, um, Manosh bought the, the guider, I bought the adapter, we take Manosh's um, uh, Lodestar camera. So in the end, that makes it super relaxing that you never feel, oh my God, I spend too much or somebody says something or somebody else has to spend it. Like that I think is really important that you find people who sort of have the same attitude towards it, that this doesn't cause any issues. Definitely important that you get along with your partners in a, in a venture like this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, I, think, I think also, I think the Mark's point, right? You are, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have unexpected expenses after your initial planning. That's the key to realize is yeah. there is going to be stuff that's going to happen, right? And, and so you want to be with partners. It's kind of like doing a road trip, right? You want to have the people in the car, you want to have fun. Like, <laughs> You know, you don't want them to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Like, well, that's not going to work. Uh, and yeah, we kind of tried our best to kind of keep each person's investment about the same. But more importantly, an adapter here, an adapter there, you, you don't want to nitpick on that, right? That's the key. The goal is clear, right? You want to get this rig up and running, right? And, and I think every one of us is kind of like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, you know, a lot of that actually came. I don't know if uh, Rob is here. Is Rob here? I I spoke to Rob actually of his uh, SRO experiences, and he had done it. And I don't know. I mean, he'd done it a while back. But th this, he didn't say it in as many words. But a lot of these sort of sentiments came along, right? You know, one of us was pulling more weight than the other. There was like all of these little things. Which I just wanted to resolve out of the start, right? Like, and that's, I think, and this is one of the first things I told Mark is, look, dude, like, if we do it, this is never going to happen. And I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. Yeah, you're not happen, right? So I think that's key because the, the problem is if you if you end up getting into those sort of, I don't know, arguments, it can only go sideways, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing, like, again, despite all these issues that we have, we three have lots of fun doing it. And I think that's the main thing. It's like, again, in the end, that's why we're doing this. It's not that you do it to get, like, with minimum effort, the most perfect images. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Sure. So but what's it's... the driving time from here to there? <laughs> I think because... <laughs> Personally, if if I were you guys, I'd I'd get an RV or something, and I'd take a rig, I take a, a portable rig down there, go down there on a new moon week, and set up my stuff and do what you normally do in your backyard, and work on your and work on your rig, <laughs> and have an ex, you have an excuse for a little star party, and get away, you know. And remember the problems go with the, the square of the. The problems go with the square of the number of rigs, right? <laughs> That's true. You should know that, Bruce. <laughs> That's true, but well, you know, you have to have more than one person, I yeah. guess. Um, no, but that's actually what what Michael and Diane told us. Like many people actually do that. That they, I mean, they uh, who don't have a setup there, who just visit the site, 
to just set up a telescope for a couple of nights and then go back. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah, I, I suggested it initially and <laughs> Mark was like, are you crazy? It's so much easier to just fly, right? It's, it, it's it is a long drive. 14, 15 hours, right? It's not, I don't think it's trivial. It's, it's, I mean, it could be fun, right? Of course, if Mark and I did it together, it would be fun, but um, it, again, it was 2020 and yeah. hanging out. Road trips are even more challenging than just doing a flight, right? Sure. Well, what kind of temperature ranges do you guys see there, depending on time of year, I guess? But you know, so during the day, it can get really, really hot. Um, I mean, not not quite as much as Arizona because it is higher up. Um, it gets above 100, but not that much. Um, and then because again, it is desert and it's pretty high up. Um, I can't remember. I think we've seen it getting like not quite too freezing, but at certain times, at certain nights, it can get close to freezing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess unless it's monsoon season, it's doing rain. is not not really a problem. Uh, there is no monsoon season. No monsoon season there at all. No, they have dust. They have dust season, like gypsum salt dust or whatever. It, okay. it it is actually amazing. Like one time when. When I was there with Beth, a thunderstorm came through it, and you could see that it's raining, but the rain doesn't hit the ground. Right. Gets, like, <laughs> I've seen that too. It's, th this was the weirdest experience. It's dark, it, you can see some rain is coming, but it, it stays dry on the ground. So this is so, <laughs> humidity is not a problem at all. Yeah, but the, the, the gypsum salt dust though does present a problem for open trust scopes. I mean, I think you guys saw right, we have a shroud around it. I mean, we are inside an observatory in a dark sky spot. You don't really need a shroud. But the reason you need it is because of the dust. And I, I, I think also, uh, right, Mark, you guys park it. Like, I think the way you set the parking position is it's pointed down. So the mirror actually uh, faces down. So the dust actually doesn't settle on the mirror. Yeah. So some minor things to keep in mind, right, with these kind of sites. Okay. You mentioned that you were the site is in the middle of nowhere, and your internet requirements, I would think, would be considerable. How does the host arrange to have good internet service in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, that that is one of the coolest things. You drive there, you have no mobile signal, nothing. Then you come to the site and they have like Wi-Fi everywhere on site and suddenly you have the best internet you ever had in your life. And I, I can only imagine like they actually recently changed it to a fiber connection. And I think they do it, it's sort of part of their, um, their investment there that they put these internet connections from either the nearest town or I don't know if you can get the speeds that we see through a, a micro, um, connection. I don't know, but that, that's basically something that is part of the service that you get. Do you think they may have had fiber run to the site? They, they have no fiber. They, they, they just upgraded their internet connection. Hey, they don't have fiber, Mark? Yeah. That's, they do, that's, right? that, that's what they just said. Like two weeks ago, they installed a new connection that is no fiber connection. So oh. way, way faster now. So before they had fiber, yeah, right. Well, even without fiber and in the middle of nowhere, now you can use Starlink for <laughs> for something. It may be, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's not something that you expect. Like it's. And then you miss the Starlink telescopes, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah it would be good to uh, get an advantage from Starlink. Eventually, we'll. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I have to say, like, one of the, I think the coolest moment was really, again, second or third night, we had the telescope together, and then Rich and I were basically in the observatory waiting for the roof to open up that we can actually start using the scope. And that moment when you sit there, you sit in a normal building with a roof, and it's the coolest thing, I have to say, like, the roof rolls off, you have this amazing sky above you, you have seven other telescopes who suddenly all start doing stuff. Uh -huh. You're sitting next to your scope. You see some of the first images. And again, the moment you look up, 
you have the most amazing view of the Milky Way. This was for me by far the coolest moment. And then one night we actually then uh, had a Zoom call with Manash who, who was at home and he's like, man, that's cool. It's like, yeah, you have no idea how, how cool it is. <laughs> there, it looks ridiculously cool. <laughs> it's alive, right? Everything just comes alive. Suddenly, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's been fun, right? I mean, even with all the problems, I mean, we haven't done a lot of imaging. Um, we've gotten some on the data, which has been difficult to process and all that, but I don't know, we still had fun and learned a lot. Mark's written some code. And... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the most important thing, definitely. Hmm. Um, you know, I was wondering, hi, uh, are you aware of any uh, scheduling for KSTARS ECOS, uh, we just you know, have scheduling the, function for that type of thing? We have the basic, you know, night at a time stuff, right? We don't have anything fancier than that. Mm -hmm. It's probably similar to what SGP and Nina have, that level of functionality. Okay. Well, as far as planning, you know, I mentioned Sky Tools for imaging, but it actually outputs in ACP language. Uh, and so in my view, somebody needs to write, you know, convert, write a converter that puts that in a SGP sequence or a K-STARS script or mm -hmm. whatever. Actually, uh, I, that's a yeah, that actually I didn't think about that. That's right. Uh, maybe hi, you and I can talk about it. the planner output. Maybe there's a way to ingest it into ECOS. Actually, the planner output is pretty much the same as what the scheduler does, except it's a little bit. I mean, the time scales are different, right? If I if I remember right. I don't know what you're asking. I'm sorry. So, so there, there's this thing called uh, ACP planner. And that basically what it does is for a particular night, you can enter a bunch of targets and then it'll spit out when each one of them should be imaged, right? It's almost like that. It's kind of like a calendar entry for each uh, target that you specify. And it does it for each night. You rerun it for the next night, it'll do it again, so on and so forth. There may be, I think what the suggestion was that to take something like that and have an integration into like ECOS or SGP, right? I mean, but you work on ECOS, so I was just saying ECOS, you use ACP planner, you enter your targets, that spits out a plan for the night, which is then ingested directly into ECOS. Yeah, I suppose, you know, it's just an XML file that the scheduler, the, you know, ECOS scheduler reads. So it would be an easy, you know, you just, if you could, and yeah, that's a trivial integration that you restart ECOS every night with a new schedule that, you know, you right. could, do that. I suppose you could, you know, run the whole thing on bash. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we know that you, you can't be sued for uh, copyright infringement on an API, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Actually, the ACP file is just plain text with some, I think there's some uh, uh, tags on it, like hashtags. But that's about it. It should be fairly simple, actually, to translate that into the XML, actually, the JSON structure. But we'll chat. We'll chat later. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Then we can get away with it from ACP. <laughs> Just exactly. ACP planner yeah. being free. Moving forward. <laughs> no, no, because that, that is something I have to say. That's something that the ACP scheduler does really well, that it can take a lot of constraints into account, I actually like that, that you set for your targets. It needs to be at least minimum height, this one. The moon needs to be this far away, or the moon needs to be fully down, or depending on the face of the moon, how far away does it need to be? Like, there's actually a lot of things that the scheduler itself really takes into account. And then I have to say, like, that's a problem that we never had, that we took an image and the image itself was bad because again, the moon was too close to bright or it was not dark enough or it was below the horizon or something. That's actually something I'm super impressed. Like that's something that they really figured out how to- But I, I wonder why 
And I keep bringing up the Sky Tools imaging, I guess, because I've been exposed to that more than ACP. But why does that exist with an output for ACP if ACP can do all that same stuff? Because Sky Tool imaging does everything you just mentioned uh, as well. I think one additional thing that Sky Tools does is actually, uh, if I remember right from using it, you can also figure out how many subframes to take for a particular target, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. ACP scheduler doesn't do that. So basically, Sky Tools, and also Sky Tools is purely just, uh, it's not in itself driving any of the astronomy programs, which is why it done, then basically you enter a target, it figures out when to image it based on all these constraints, and also how many subframes based on the surface brightness of the target, whatever creates an ACP plan and then gives it to ACP, which can then actually do the, the automation of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way I understand it. Like ACP is then driving all the astronomy equipment. Sky Tools doesn't do the astronomy equipment piece, right? The scheduler on the other hand, except for the number of subframe frames piece, it's doing everything else, right? The only mm -hmm. thing they don't do is given a target, how many subframes should it have based on their chip dimensions and chip characteristics. And, and how that. long should they be and yeah. Yeah, yeah they don't yeah. do that. But we, we basically what Mark, uh, myself and Rich use is, I have a, a similar spreadsheet that I created. It's a tool basically, uh, which is using some noise characteristics and sky brightness and all that for the region. Mm -hmm. And from that, it actually spits out how many subframes we want for a particular SNR target, right? Like, so you right. can say I want an SNR target of 10, and here's sort of the sky brightness, here's sort of the tar target brightness, and then it'll spit our image for 30 hours with 600 second subs or whatever, right? And that's what we're using yeah. right now. I think Francesco does something similar too. And I, I mean, I'm happy to share, share that, that, that spreadsheet tool that I have with everybody here. I mean, I can, it's, it's nothing extraordinary. You just take some characteristics of the chip and then figures out sort of what the optimal uh, subframe length is and the total length for a particular signal to noise. The, yes. the subframe length is determined based on uh, short noise and read noise. Yeah. Uh, read noise alone, and then the full full uh, stack is based on the short noise and, and the other stuff. How does it yeah, work with the... uh, CMOS yeah. cameras so... versus CCD cameras? Because I know uh, Sky Tools uh, had an issue where, I mean, the developer and Glenn had talked about it. And basically, it was really CCD oriented, and he really yeah. didn't know how to deal with C CMOS cameras for, as Same far as judging me. exposure. Same with me, actually. It's big for CCDs because they're more deterministic. With CMOS, I mean, the, beyond a certain threshold, though, they kind of start behaving like CCDs because it averages out, right? Uh, so once you're above sort of the minute threshold, I think it's fine. I've been using it with my CMOS, the QHY600M, and it works just fine. Uh, but if you're under that, then I don't think the calculations hold anymore because they're doing per pixel uh, circuits to read. CCD is not, right? So the read noise, the way it varies and all that is different between CMOS and CCD. Right? I think, Bruce, you and I have spoken about this. Like with my CMOS, the one thing I'm doing is I'm using the same calculations. Uh, but I don't do bias frames. I'm just doing dark and, and black. Okay. Well, and the, the other thing is um, in Sky Tools for imaging, you know, he's making assumptions about binning based on CCDs, and there really isn't any advantage yeah. to, you don't get the, the, yeah. the read noise advantage from memory, uh, you know, from the. Yeah. You know, the, the, I don't know who this is that's speaking. It says iPhone, but. Uh, it's Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Hey. Um, well, one thing I'm doing with the CMOS is because you know it's USB three on, on the 600M at least it's USB three, and I want you should you guys should know this. The ML5100 is a 50 megapixel camera. It's on USB two. A download of a single subframe takes upwards of 18 seconds. Okay, and it's just something to keep in mind. With my QHY 600M, it's 100 megapixels, but it's USB three, and it takes about three seconds. So I'm not even doing binning anymore. I mean, I just shoot yeah. one by one. Everything is one by one. So that keeps the math simple. It also keeps my subframe length simple. Uh, and I anyway, you know, the, the amount of chances you get to do RGB is very low anyways, right? I mean, where I'm using it now, mm -hmm. which is here. 
but even if even if we were to do it in new mexico or something because it's only three seconds we'd probably just do one by one if we were to use the cmos camera yeah disk is cheap right i mean you don't really care about the disk space it's really the, the time it takes to download images and as long as you yeah, can yeah no i was it, just talking about the 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 assumptions in the planning software right that especially where he's predicting you know subframes and exposure times and stuff so yeah. you know you can't you can't do anything with the binning uh if you're using cmos because he's assuming ccd yeah i've cross validated my calculations with the sky tools and it seems fairly close like this so i think my my numbers are right like my math is right mm -hmm. uh I'm happy to share the spreadsheet. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and I, I, you know, basically what I do is I just use a rule of thumb. At some point, I, you know, you don't even, it doesn't even matter anymore to go between targets and what this one is, lower surface brightness. So I'm going to adjust nothing. I mean, I just have one sort of recipe that I use for LRGB and another recipe that I use for SHO. And I just rinse, repeat, right? Yeah. And for the most part, you may lose some faint nebulosity, whatever, but. Yeah, no, that's pretty much what I, what I do too. Um, but I need to learn to, uh, you know, at, at some point with the Bortle seven or eight skies, you you can't pick a target that's dimmer than the than the light pollution, no matter how many yeah, hours you're willing to put in, right? It's just not going to show up. I know. So. Yeah, I think one. But, but yeah, yeah. One one final thing we just said about sort of um, download times and everything. That's I think something that we did really well. Again, uh, saying something positive about Google. Um, Google Drive is actually really cool how we used it. That we basically set up Google Drive with an account that we all have access to, and so Google Drive on one side it uploads all the images immediately to the cloud, and then we can download it all to our computers. That is the one part that we never had a problem with. That's actually really cool. Like, how do we get files on and off that machine there? It just happened sort of overnight, and we all have access to it. That's very nice. That is the one thing that we figured out. <laughs> the file transfer and sharing, yay. <laughs> but what about edge computing? <laughs> nope. Nothing fancy like that. <laughs> old client server <laughs> well uh, i look forward to an update from you guys when you get all these issues whipped uh, when we get to the next level of issues <laughs> where do you do you guys don't post on on like astropen right mark you use your blog or it, it, it's both i usually have sort of more sort of explanations and everything on my blog, but I usually have all my images on Astrobin. But that's how you can see, it's like we have the equipment up now for almost a year. We literally got one image out of it so far. We have a lot of partial data, but one Yeah, image. it's 2020, <laughs> yeah. or it was anyway. Um, well, thank you very much for, uh, Oh, hi, kids. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing all these uh, uh, adventures with us. We all yeah. appreciate it. And, and like I said, we look forward to an update. I'm sure you're going to whip all these problems. Um, and um, hopefully we'll all get out under the stars together sometime soon. Um, things are loosening up in our region here. So Glenn, do you have anything? to uh, announce about workshops or anything like that? What have you heard from the Open Space Authority lately? No, we're in that place where I keep pinging Terry and, and nothing comes back. So um, no updates yet, but I've been putting in way too many hours on, uh, you know, how to stream from, from telescope computers, both for, for, the, for imaging uh, workshops, I've got it nailed pretty well how we'll do it. Um, and then I'm also working on, you know, little raspberry pies with cameras that, that could be dropped in at regular star parties uh, for visual observers. 
uh, to, and the point is to, to stream to people's, the public smartphones without any prerequisites or internet requirements. Um, so to make it more socially distancing, you know, you're not sharing eyepieces, you're not touching multiple scopes and stuff. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing project that I'm, that I'm working on, uh, that'll help at some point. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's, and then I, I posted, you know, I, uh, um, set up the, the club brig in the yard and, and redoing all the software and stuff. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been a year. So there's lots of everything basically needed to be updated and stuff. So it was interesting to set up a new rig after a year and, and get my hands dirty, remembering all of the little steps and stuff. So that's good for me anyway, but hopefully I'll be able to share that with people in the field soon. Um, Actually, one thing where you just say it like, so I bought one of these, um, what was it, Unistella EV scopes? Yeah. I don't know if you've looked into it. I think they could be fantastic for public viewing. Yeah. Because one thing I didn't realize it, you can actually, if people install the software on their phones, you can actually connect to the scope with many, many phones at the same time. Mm -hmm. And everybody can basically see the image on their own phone. Yeah, that was actually the inspiration for, oh, for yeah. this. Um, so the, the club has uh, just purchased one for the school star party program. And we will definitely also uh, check it out for, for star parties. But um, frankly, you know, the, the, the club has plenty of money what we don't have is enough volunteers, right? We've got this, the same cast of characters that, that, you know, are both in many cases, both board members and running a program and they're already at their, their max capacity, right? And so what we really need is more club members to, to, to step up and volunteer to do something like that and run with it. It's like, and, and I don't mean to pick on you, Mark, but it's like, Somebody oh, I feel it's one spectacularly. Say, I'm going to show up at the star party. And I'm going to operate this thing, and I'm going to train other people how to use it yeah. too. And you know, that's that's kind of what we need. Yeah, yeah. I actually, uh, Glenn, that's a good point. I mean, I, used, I can't. I think drop off. You know, I used to run the the Luna program, right? It's just yeah, yeah. I, sometimes life gets in the way of living, right? Yeah. So, you know, but I, I would love to, I mean, I, I'd love to try and be a volunteer for one of these things again. Uh, I think Ed was doing this stuff, you know, the binocular stargazing. Like, so, some of these are really interesting to me, right? Yeah. And to Mark's point, uh, I did actually you know, participate in the, in the school thing. I mean, I think I taught in one of the schools here for a couple of years. But uh, yeah, I just couldn't sustain it. You know, it's like time pressures and, and whatnot. Yeah, so there needs to be, and again, I'm not directing this at anybody necessarily on this call. I'm, ju I'm just saying this, this is what I see the club, one way the club is lacking, right? So there needs to be a constant flow of new yeah. volunteers that come in and do stuff and then maybe they move on and that's fine. But you know, right now that's what's that's what's limiting us to, to and and we're you know we've done a, a an amazing amount of stuff with the armchair star parties and we have people from all over the country watching those and stuff. But um, you know we could we could do even more. You know if we had more human capital. You know so. Yeah, I mean, it would be good. I mean, right now, I wouldn't know, even if I wanted to become a volunteer, this is just a suggestion, right? I wouldn't even know where you guys have gaps, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, there's just some easy way of figuring out if there are areas where I want, and like, now that's of interest to me as well, or maybe Mark and me together because we're running a remote observatory, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having a list of things that you guys are looking to do but don't have the human capital yeah. to do. Would be good. Yeah, I don't know what that is. If it probably already exists, but well, we need a vice president. <laughs> um, good plug. Good plug. Yeah, man. I'll talk to you yeah. offline. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess Bruce, that's pretty much what what I had. Oh, 
I do have something else. And so I've been keeping this to myself very selfishly and I just can't in good conscience do this anymore. But I am super happy with this uh, auto integrate.js script that I didn't know about and telescope.live included a, a plug for it in one of their newsletters. And I am just so much happier in Pix Insight and going so much further in Pix Insight now with this script. I just love it to death. Um, it, it wants pre-calibrated files, which you could do with uh, uh, weighted batch pre-processing if you didn't have calibrated files already. Um, but it just takes you all the way through to where you're, you're, you've got a TIFF file that's ready to go into Photoshop and uh, in one, one or two button presses. It's just amazing, and both for narrowband and for RGB, Wow. And LRGB. And uh, I just, it's just amazing. It really, I think if you look at the, you could probably look at my Astro bin and you could probably see, you know, the, the, the improvements and even the things I went back and reprocessed would, would stand out. So I'm just really happy. And uh, like I said, I can't keep it to myself anymore. So it's not, it's not in a repository. You have to get it from like a GitHub and install it. Um, but, you know, just Google auto-integrate.js and, and you can download the zip file from the GitHub and, and put it in. Is anybody um, else using Astro Pixel processor? I, I keep seeing people saying, you know, I couldn't deal with PixInsight and so I'm trying something else, yeah. I, I've been using it. It's actually, I mean, you can't deal with chips like a 5100 with different games and all that, uh, but on easier chips, it's been working out pretty well. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's smart enough to auto assign masters to channels and do integration by channel and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, local normalization, it does all of those things, right? Like, I mean, everything you'd expect it seems to work pretty well. I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's just multi threaded and stuff like that. I'll check out this auto integrate as well, but so far, I've been using. Uh, Astro Pixel processor. Uh, yeah. It's not free, but it's not too expensive either. Well, and I, you know, I it took me a long time to get even started in Pix Insight, and I pretty much just been using, you know, weighted batch preprocessing and the easy, whatever suite, whatever that's called, the easy processing suite. So I, I don't, haven't really got into the individual processes like you're supposed to. But that's where this script just, you know, it's, you don't have to. It's just you press the button and it goes through the whole thing for you. So um, hmm. I've been really happy with it. Definitely have to check that out. Yeah. Well, and you've got some data now, too. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody uh, have any questions? or images that you guys have come up with in the past month or so uh, that you wanted to share? No takers, okay. Well, um, I'm actually uh, going to be away in the middle of next month. So uh, I would say I'll see you, but I don't know if I'll have a connection where I'm going, so we'll see. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to grab the reins and uh, host the next meeting. And um, we're working on something interesting. So um, have fun at the next meeting. I hope to see you there. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess this uh, will conclude our imaging SIG meeting for the month. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sharing again, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys again. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye, all. Thanks. Take care.